Heavenly Father, would you bless the words that I speak? Would Jesus Christ be glorified and the Holy Spirit be at work in our hearts and in our minds? In Jesus' name. Amen. Christmas is almost over. Soon we can take a deep breath and a sigh of release and, and say, now let your servant depart in peace from this season of cheer and feasting. But before we do, let's consider that third song of Luke's gospel connected to the infancy of Jesus. You might recall from your Bibles that the first song is the song of Zechariah. And then you have the song of Mary. And finally, in our passage today, Luke 2, 22 to 38, we find the third song, the song of Simeon. Popularly, it's known as the Nunc Dimittis, which is the first two words of this song in Latin, meaning now release or now depart. And this song is much shorter than the song of Zechariah and the song of Mary, but pithiness is not a crime, though you wouldn't believe that from the length of my sermons. And packed into these three short lines are a wonderful and hard-hitting truth. So what's going on in this short and pithy song and the passage around it? Let's look at some context. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. He's circumcised like every Jew on the eighth day. And 33 days later, comes a necessary purification rituals. Mary, according to Leviticus 12, must be purified following the childbirth. And the standard sacrifice is a lamb. But if you couldn't afford a lamb, you could instead sacrifice two doves. Clearly, Mary and Joseph are not wealthy. They're not dirt poor by any means, but they're not wealthy enough for a lamb, clearly the Magi have not yet been delivering their gold. And so they opt for two doves as the sacrifice. And they head to Jerusalem, to the temple complex, the outer courts, the court for the Gentiles and the court for women. And it's in one of those two courts that they encounter an elderly man called Simeon. Now, Simeon is righteous. He is devout, a model believer, a man on whom the Holy Spirit lay, something unusual in the Old Covenant. The Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the promised Messiah. And so he waited, day by day, night by night, longing to see the consolation of Israel, the, the comfort of of Israel. It's the same word news for the Holy Spirit as another comforter. It's the comfort and consolation of Israel he looks for. And here we see the first great truth of our passage today. The consolation of Israel is not a thing, it's a person. Most people in Israel at this time were looking for the Messiah. They longed for the glory of Israel and the vindication of their people, for the promised comfort and consolation of God that would come and free Israel from her oppressors. They expected a military uprising, a time of national renewal and prosperity. They were looking for a leader to train them and lead them through warfare and violence and carry them through to a victory so great that the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the Egyptians, none would ever rule over them again. The consolation they were looking for was an earthly victory, bringing earthly material rewards. But they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Simeon did. Simeon, he saw the truth. It was revealed to him by God. He knew that the consolation and comfort of the people of Israel promised by God was not a military victory or a season of earthly prosperity, but a person. The Messiah himself was the consolation which was promised. Where do we look? for consolation and comfort. Last year, 2020, was a tough year, a rough year, a dark year. 
many of us will not be able to recall nationally, globally, a more desperate and morbid year. A year so dominated by darkness and fear. The temptation ever present is to look for consolation and comfort in earthly things, to, to gorge ourselves on food and drink, our habits, our hobbies. Alternatively, we, we look to worldly promises around a vaccine or government support. Finally, at long last, these will bring about consolation for our land. But the Bible says not to trust in such transitory things. The true consolation, the true comfort we need in these dark times is not found anywhere except in the person of Jesus the Christ. Only he can break the fear of death which has been rammed into all of us over and over again in the past year. Only he can undo the chains of anxiety and sadness which bind our hearts. Only he can heal the pain and the suffering which is caused by sin. Ultimately, only Christ can give eternal life. What all this sadness and anxiety and fear in our lives causes is a lack of peace. So notice when Simeon sees the promised consolation of Israel in the form of a, a child, he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Only now can Simeon die and die in peace. As the Bible commentator Matthew Paul said, none of us can die in peace till we have seen the Lord's salvation with a spiritual eye. None of us can die in peace until we have seen the Lord's salvation with a spiritual eye. If we want peace amidst the turbulence of the world, then only in Christ the Lord's salvation, will we find it? So, Simeon continues to praise God in song. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. Here, and in the following verses, Simeon, led by the Holy Spirit, draws on the language of the servant songs of Isaiah. Jesus is the Lord's salvation, which should not surprise us. After all, his name is Jesus, which in Hebrew means the Lord saves. It's right there in the name. And this salvation is prepared in the sight of all nations. It's not a hidden salvation, a secret saviour. Jesus is salvation come before the nations. His ministry touched not only the Jews, but Samaritans and Romans and Gentiles and slaves. His trial was in public before a Roman governor, before Gentile soldiers, a Roman installed king. He was enthroned on a Roman cross high above the city for all to see. Was it not a Roman soldier who said truly this is the son of God? Persian magicians came to see the new king bearing gifts for a time he sojourned in the land of Egypt. Yes, Jesus was a Jew. Oh yes, he was a Jew. We must never lose sight of that wonderful truth. A Jew from a devout Jewish family who fulfilled all the law's requirements as we see in our passage today. He was circumcised, his mother was purified, everything was done the Jewish way. But his salvation was to shine beyond the people of Israel. And this was the crux of the issue. The Jews were looking for a military Messiah, not a nation converting Christ. They were looking for a military Messiah, not a nation converting Christ. The promise to Abraham was that God would bless all nations through his descendants. Not that he would found an isolationist empire. 
The glory of God shines so brightly it cannot be contained under the bushel basket of a single nation. The role of the chosen people, the glory, the privilege, the joy of the chosen people was to spread the blessing of God to the world, not to hoard it away for themselves. And so we see what kind of Messiah, what kind of saviour Jesus was to be. A light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Jesus is the glory of the Lord. Come to Israel, come to his people. The presence and the splendour of God himself made manifest among his people. Fulfilling all their promises and it's a light which shines among his people and beyond. Shines into the darkness, giving knowledge of God to the Gentiles. To us in Britain, to the people of South America, to the Polynesians of the vast Pacific seas, to the people of the land of the rising sun. Here at the start of Jesus' life is a clear message. Comfort, consolation, Peace, salvation are found in a person, in Jesus the Christ. And this message is for people of all lands. So that's two key things. Consolation and peace are a person and the good news is for all people. But then Simeon prophesies during a blessing of the family This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And here's the third point. This message, this person is a point of division and strife in the world. As Jesus himself said, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus' own family was divided by the ministry and message which he brought, wanting him taken away from the people he served because they thought him insane. Such was the opposition to him at times that Jesus said to those around him, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Pointing to the disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Yes, Mary's heart would be pierced by grief at the foot of the cross over her son's death. But before then, in the doing of the Lord's work, there was much pain and sorrow and grief and doubt in Mary's heart. And this doubt And grief and strife and opposition would come from all angles, not just from his own family. Truly, the hearts of men were revealed by the light and many spoke against Jesus. But many spoke for him as well. And so it was that all people took a side. And those who took the side of Jesus were lifted up and blessed with eternal life and joy. And those who opposed Jesus, they fell into ever greater darkness until ultimately they stumbled into eternal hell. Everyone who lives ultimately either falls into darkness or rises into new light based on their reaction to Jesus. There is no other name given to men under heaven than Jesus Christ and we must be saved by it. Jesus alone is the salvation of Israel. Jesus alone is the salvation of the Gentiles. Jesus alone is the light of the world. 
He is the door of salvation, the good shepherd of our souls, the resurrection, the true vine, the way, the truth, the life. Jesus alone can save. So what are you going to do about him? How are you going to respond at the start of this new year, looking back at the last year? How have you responded to Jesus? Is he your Lord, your God, your saviour? Has Jesus been your comfort and consolation through the past year? Is Jesus so much to you that you can face death, that very real threat all around us, without fear, but instead with peace? The prospect of departing this life holding no power over you. Has your following of Jesus been a source of division? In your family, as Jesus promised it would be. Has it been a source of division with your friends? The people think you're mad for your beliefs. Has Jesus been your saviour as you've repented of your sin and embraced the forgiveness that only he on the cross can offer? Have you believed in Jesus? And so we see in Simeon three things. Firstly, the consolation of Israel is a person. Secondly, that this person is the saviour of all nations. And thirdly, thirdly, we have found that making a decision around him is the basis of the rising or falling of people. What we decide about Jesus, what we believe about Jesus, will decide our ultimate fate. But there's one more thing to consider in this passage. The prophetess Anna daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. Seeing what was said by Simeon about this child Jesus, she didn't speak a blessing over Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus. She did something different. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to a redemption of Jerusalem. Anna thus tells us what we must do about those three truths that we have just covered. We must tell them to the people. Anna spoke those truths to those in Jerusalem who were looking forward to its redemption. But the command of Christ is broader. We must tell it to the ends of the earth. How can Christ be the revelation to the Gentiles, the Lord of people from every tribe and language and tongue and nation? If they've never heard of his name. Christ was prepared in the sight of all the nations. But our task, our joy, our privilege is to proclaim what his life and death and resurrection and ascension means to them. From Yorkshire to the Euphrates, from Peru to Kathmandu. So, a person who is the consolation and grants us peace who saves the world and before whom we must make a choice. And a choice we must, absolutely must, present to the entire world. That is the message of our passage, the message of the Nunc Dimittis. And that is the message with which we must depart this service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you gave us salvation and consolation and peace in the person of Jesus Christ your son. Lord, would you lead our hearts to believe in him with all that we have, no matter what opposition we might face. And Lord, would you give us the courage and the energy and the will and the desire to proclaim his name to all people in our neighbourhood, in our city, in our nation and around this world. For there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. In whose name we pray, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.